So good morning and uh, welcome to the second day of the conference. Uh, some of you, I hope, had a invigorating <coughs> trip to the hill. For those of us who are over the hill, I don't think we could get there. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Alexandra Silva uh, give the invited talk on an algebraic framework to reason about concurrency. Uh, Alexand I mean, one of the great things about FSTTCS is that we do get in uh, good young researchers who are at the top of their game, and uh, Alexandra is one such of these people. Um, so she is a professor at the University College London and uh, got her PhD from Radboud University in 2010 working with uh, Jan Rutten and Marcelo Bonseg. Bon is that how you pronounce bon it? Bonsangwe. And um, it's about 20 years since I heard Jan Rutten talking about co-algebra and um, uh, Alexandra's thesis on Claney co-algebras is something which is worth reading. Uh, she won the Pressburger Prize awarded by EATCS in 2017. Uh, the BCS gave her the Needham Award in 2018 and the Royal Society's Wolf, Wolfson Award she got uh, this earlier this year. Right. So welcome. Thank you. Um, so thank, thanks very much for the um, invitation. Um, it is a, a great pleasure to be at FSTTCS. Um, I was due to come here in 2010. Uh, I had a paper, but this was a week before my PhD defense. And my supervisor at that time was very scared of me traveling to India a week before I had to defend. So he forbid me of coming. And it has, it has been one of my biggest regrets, um, not having to been able to, uh, to come to, um, to India and present uh, present that paper. Um, sadly, the co-author who came and presented the paper became very ill in the months after he visited India, so my supervisor will always stand by that uh, decision, pointing to that. But anyway, so it's a great pleasure to be here today, and um, I'd like to spend the next hour telling you a little bit about um, some work I've been doing the last three years. Um, it is it is a summary of, of um, a collection of papers, but also a summary of, of some of the things I want to do in the coming years um, and about some somewhat vision, the vision I have to reason about um, concurrency. This is um, joint work with um, two of my students and some other um, collaborators in, in London and in the Netherlands. And today, for those of you who uh, follow the news in the UK, um, it is a very important day in the UK. It is election day, and it's probably one of the most important elections we have had in the last few years, and it's all about Europe. And funnily enough, um, this project was completely developed since my move to the UK, but it was also completely funded by European funds. So I think it is um, quite telling that today we are um, deciding on a new prime minister and whether to leave the EU. So like Ranko, I decided to include an European flag on my talk and um, hope for the best at the end of today for the UK. So we have a project uh, website with, with a lot of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about. And um, some of these people are finishing their PhD and are on the market. Uh, this is my PhD student, Tobias Capé, and the other student, Jana Wagmacher, and postdoc Paul Brunet, um, who's uh, currently a uh, postdoc in, in London, but is definitely on the market. So if you want to hire um, some good people, this is a little advertisement for them as well. So the broad context of this work is program verification. So we, um, we have programs, and programs have bugs, and we want to find these bugs because, you know, ultimately um, we would like to have programs that have no bugs. And, and these bugs can come from, from a source, from many sources. Um, sometimes we have bugs because the language in which we're programming is not, does not have a very precise semantics. Um, for those of you who have programmed in C a little bit, you might have come across um, some of these 
phenomenon in which you program something, you're convinced it's doing A, but it's actually doing B. And it's very subtle to kind of figure out why the program is not doing what you're looking for. Sometimes the uh, error is introduced by the compiler. So you have a program, the language might even have a very nice semantics, but then you have a compiler, and whoever programmed the compiler might have made a mistake. Uh, a compiler is a program, so it might have bugs as well. Uh, then it might be that the hardware in which you're running the program has, is faulty, and so when you're running your program, you're expecting a certain instruction to be executed in a certain way, but there's a problem with the hardware, and therefore the result you get out of your program um, is different than what you started with. So the fact that you have all these sources of um, errors, and the fact that programs in general can get very complex very quickly, um, make program verification very hard. It's a bit like an iceberg. If you start looking for a bug and you start going deep and deep, it's, an, it's a no-ending no task. Now, things get even harder if you look at how this program executes in context. Because, um, especially nowadays, we see that a lot of these programs are executed in the cloud, and you have some distributed computation going on, or um, maybe you have a program that is communicating, is installed in one device, but is communicating with another device, and you're transferring data around, and your, uh, the result of your program this depends on this data, and there are synchronizations missing, etc. So you have even more layers. So the layers of complexity are, are never ended when it comes to, um, to verification. And um, yet, we would like to be able to assert properties about programs. And we would like to be able to give assurances that certain programs do what they are supposed to be doing. And so what you see a, a sort of trend in program verification is that you start with a program um, or a collection, collection of programs in which you want to find a bug, but then uh, you don't really analyze that program in its entirety. You, t you have to abstract away what the program is doing. And this abstraction can be, um, can be very different. So you can do an abstraction by saying, well, you know what, I'm going to restrict looking at my program without data values. So I'm actually just going to look at the control flow. And maybe for a certain property you're looking for, that's enough. Maybe you don't care about the data. Or maybe you do care about the data, but then you say, I don't care about the specific data, but I only care about certain intervals. So actually, I can cluster my data. So I can, I can say, well, anything between 0 and 1 million for me is the same. Anything above 1 million is different. And so you kind of cluster your data, and you end up having an input set or an output set that is much smaller because you divided it. Or maybe um, you don't want to look at the body of your functions, and you want to just analyze how function calls um, are working. And so you kind of mostly delete or abstract away what the program is doing and just keep the function calls with their um, variables. Or maybe you have a very specific property in mind, and that property only talks about one variable. And so if the property only talks about one variable, then you can do what is called slicing, which is go through your program and basically ignore anything that operates on, on other variables. So you build a sort of dependency graph of that variable, and you get a collection of things that matter, but all the rest you can kind of throw away. So there's all kinds of techniques that you can use um, to make the, the, this task of, of finding bugs or analyzing programs a bit easier, or at least feasible up to a certain, um, to a certain point. And um, let me start by giving you a very sort of naive example of what I mean by abstraction. And, and it's mostly what I will be using uh, in this talk, the type of abstraction I'll be using in this talk. So imagine that you give as a task to a student the following. Write a program that prints n smileys separated by a space. So I don't tell you what n is. Um, I just tell you some positive. N, and you have this character, this smiley character, and you have a space character. So, so my students 
came up with two different programs. So the first program says, OK, I initialize some counter i at 1. And while that i is smaller than n, then I print the smiley, and then I print the space, and I increase the counter. Okay? The other one initializes the counter at 1, prints a first smiley, because, well, I said that I want n to be greater than 0. Um, and then, while the counter does not reach n, she prints a space, and then a smiley, etc. Okay? So they give me these two programs. And one first sort of sanity check would be to ask, are these two programs equivalent? Are they really doing the same thing? Who thinks they are doing the same thing? So if you want to check if they are doing the same thing, you need to, you know, you could stare at them for a while because they are small enough that you can stare at them. Um, but a way to also um, check they are equivalent is to kind of abstract a little bit some of the details in the slide. And that's what I'm going to do. And the way I'm going to abstract away this, this example is by using this triangle. You can think of programs, um, if you go back here, you can think of programs, especially sequential programs, as a sequence of actions. So you have an action and then you have another action. And maybe you have a choice of two actions. Maybe you have a repetition of actions, like with this while loop. So in essence, these type of programs, you can write them almost as regular expressions, if you abstract away enough. And I'll, I'll mention in a moment how. So if, if one exploits this sort of this side of the triangle, in which programs can be written as regular expressions, then regular expressions and regular languages have a long tradition and ha there's a lot of results to do algebraic reasoning and also co-algebraic reasoning using automata. Uh, so you can do equivalence at this level. So if you want to ask if two programs are equivalent, you can look at whether their abstractions are equivalent. And then you can go back and say something about the programs themselves. Of course, you cannot say everything about the program, because you will perform some abstraction to get the regular expression out of the program. But you can, you can say some things about what you learned in your algebraic reasoning at the lower level. So for instance, for these two programs, one could think of this program here as follows. I first, the first character I see here is a smiley. And it's inside a while loop that is executing for n times. And I don't know how, how many n, how much n is. So it's an arbitrary number of n times. So actually, I can abstract away this whole while loop using a star by saying, OK, I see a smiley and then a space. And I do this a finite number of times for an arbitrary n. And then at the very end, I print another smiley. The other program starts by printing a smiley at the beginning and then does the same thing in the while loop, but in which the space and the smiley are reversed. Okay? And so now the question is, are these two regular expressions the same? And um, for those of you who, who know a little bit about um, regular expressions and, and syntax, you will see that these two regular expressions are uh, almost the same, except that the brackets are somehow slided to the right. And this is um, an instance of, of an axiom called the sliding rule. And so, in fact, these two regular expressions are the same. And so, in fact, these programs, or their abstractions at least, are the same. Which basically is telling me, if I think of this regular expression and its language as denoting the traces that this program can produce, it's just telling me the traces of the programs are the same. OK? So the abstraction here is basically ignoring instructions like print and replacing the while loop by this star. Okay? So there's a little bit of work there. But once that is done, then we can basically just look at that. Another way of checking that they are equivalent is by translating their expressions to the deterministic finite automaton 
sorry, these are actually non-deterministic. The non-deterministic finite automata that accept the language of those expressions and then basically use these automata to run a bisimulation game to show that they accept the same language. But at this level, so at the level of regular languages and regular expressions and automata, there's been a lot of, a lot of work on, on equivalence. Now, with sequential programs, um, we know roughly what to do when we want to abstract away and we want to analyze their behavior. Now, moving on to um, concurrent programs, this is an example taken from, uh, from a web page on, on weak memory models. Um, it's, it's not super important, but basically it's, it's a program that has two threads, T0 and T1. And these threads are operating on variables x and y. So we have these two variables, x and y. And each of the threads has a local register. Thread 0 has register R1, and thread 1 has register R2. And so I'm executing these two things in parallel. And I know that when I start running this program, x is 0 and y is 0. And I would like to assert at the end, that after I run these threads, that what I have is that the two variables cannot both be 0. So this is a bit confusing, the notation that, um, that is used here. But you should think of this as not what is in there. I think I have it in the slides. So I want to assert basically the negation of of this conjunction, which I wrote, I wrote here. So basically what I want to say is the following. This is a concurrent program. I don't know in which um, order the instructions of these threads are going to be executed. It could be that I execute line A, line B, line C, and line D. It could be that I execute A, C, B, D. It could be that I execute you know, A, C, D, B. I could do any order of these lines. And I'm, and I'm assuming each line is atomic. But given that the lines are atomic, I know nothing about the order. What I know is that if I execute A, if I either execute A or C first, then either X or Y will be 1. So in the next step, eventually, either R1 or R2 have to be 1. Hence, at the end of the execution, it is impossible that I have both registers to be 0. Because when can I have R1 to be 0? Well, for R1 to be 0, it means that C hasn't executed. right? Because if C executes, then Y is 1. So if I made it here with R1 0, it also means that A has executed, because in each thread, I have a sequential, it's sequentially consistent. So each thread executes sequentially. So if I made it here with R1, 0, then X is 1. But if X is 1, then whenever I execute line D, R2 has to be 1. And the other way around. So if I made it here with X being 0 and R2 being 0, then Y is 1. Hence, when I execute line B, I must have that R1 will become 1. Okay? So this program, this two-line program, takes about five minutes to explain, which is slightly um, puzzling, but it, it is, it, it, it's kind of, I want to illustrate a little bit how things get much more interesting once you add concurrency. And there's a lot of examples like this, um, especially in, in this sort of weak memory model world, a lot of examples of programs that are two threads with two lines and have simple conditions like the ones um, on this slide, yet reasoning about them is really hard. And techniques to reason about them have popped in the literature. There's all kinds of, of things in the last few years. And we still are to find um, sort of an automated way to um, to fully reason about such programs. And so this is kind of the motivation for, for the work I want to show you. I would like to be able to reason about these programs 
in the same way as we did before for sequential programs. So I have some sort of um, dream and wish that sort of regular expressions enriched with special constructs should enable us to reason algebraically um, about these programs. And hopefully, it should also guide us to produce the right type of automata to capture the uh, sort of control flow of these programs and reason about control and, and data flow. So this program here, for instance, I would like to be able to write an expression of this kind. Um, I would like to be able to write something like, if I start with x is 0 and y is 0, and then I compose that with these two threads, t0 and t1, in parallel, then this whole execution should imply that at the end I have, I do not have r1 is 0 and r2 is 0. And then I would like to be able to, to use this property, uh, to verify this property by using some equivalence checking, as I did before for regular languages. So that, that's kind of the wish, um, the wish that, that I have. And um, it would somehow help us in verify at least some properties of um, concurrent programs. The thing about concurrency is that, um, as I said, it gets quite hard. So when we started this um, project uh, back in 2016, um, I was reading uh, a paper by, by Hoare and Struth uh, on concurrent linear algebra. And I thought, basically, they had the answer. And I just had to kind of figure out how to apply it to these examples. Um, but as we went on, I realized that, yeah, things are much harder than they looked to starting with. And it's a bit like this XKCD um, cartoon. I mean, six months later, or in this case, three years later, we're still um, working on it. But so let me um, give you a roadmap of this talk in, in one slide. So basically, the idea is as follows. If one starts with linear algebra, and this goes back to, to the 50s, um, you can kind of analyze sequential programs in the style of what I showed a few slides ago. Then if you want to talk about control flow, so if you want to have variables and analyze their Boolean values, then you move to a slightly richer language uh, called linear algebra with tests. And um, this was introduced in the 90s by Cozen and people in his team. And on another dimension, back in 2009, uh, linear algebra was enriched with a parallel operator, giving rise to something that people call concurrent linear algebra. Um, and so the uh, kind of our original idea was, well, we have these two things. We should just be able to merge them and get a system, which we would call CCAT, um, that would allow us to reason about programs that have both uh, control flow and concurrency. And in fact, when we started looking at it, there was a paper by Peter Gibson that was already hinting at, that this should be possible. And there was a paper by uh, Peter O'Hearn and, and others as well in 2015, also kind of hinting that this should be possible. Um, the problem was that you know there were a lot of hints and a lot of conjectures, but very few proofs on, on what actually worked. And so our initial plan was to just fill the gaps that these papers had. Um, and what I will show you is that filling the gaps uh, turn, showed us that, in fact, this strategy was not quite um, the right one. So let's start from, from the beginning. And let's um, spend a couple of minutes just going through um, the basic def definitions and results on, on Clean algebra. Um, so Clean algebra is the algebra of regular expressions. It was introduced in the 50s by Stephen Kleene. And it basically gives us this nice way of reasoning about traces or, or regular languages and to encode patterns. So regular expressions uh, are a nice, syn a nice compact syntax to capture patterns in traces. So for instance, you can you know, write the multiples of three in binary, or you can write um, all words over, over an alphabet. And Kleene, in his uh, paper in 56, gave this, this result that became a cornerstone in, in theoretical computer science, saying, actually, 
regular expressions are equivalent, so the denotational semantics of regular expressions, regular languages, are also the languages that are accepted by deterministic finite automata. And that translation between syntax and um, operational semantics in terms of automata became um, a technique that is exploited in equivalence uh, checking. And sometimes using expressions is very convenient uh, because it's easier to, to capture the pattern. But when it comes to implementing, say, an algorithm on equivalence checking, it's traditionally easier to translate the expression down to an automaton and then doing the equivalence at the automaton level. So this sort of correspondence between syntax and, on the one hand, and operational semantics on the other, Clinton's theorem, has become a sort of tool in, in theoretical computer science to, um, to check for equivalence. And that uh, observation was then extended to, to other languages. So Clini algebra allows us to capture uh, patterns, but it doesn't allow us to talk about control flow. So the only thing it allows us to talk about is, um, if, so if, we, if we're now thinking at the program abstraction level, uh, you can talk about atomic actions. So those are, would be the letters of the alphabet. We can talk about an execution aborting or, or um, skipping. That's the sort of the zero and one. There's a non-deterministic choice and the sequential composition. And then the star that allows us to talk about um, repetition. And um, also in um, his paper, Kline and later other people proposed axioms or equations that would enable us to reason algebraically about equivalence. So things like you know, non-deterministic choices, idempotent and commutative and associative. Um, and also, and this goes back to Cosen in the early 90s, um, two uh, e equations that say that the star is a fixed point and is in fact a least fixed point, so that this iteration can be built as a least fixed point. And so this set of um, equations was proven in the 90s um, to be sound and complete for language equivalence. So if two expressions are equivalent, so if two regular expressions are equivalent, then there is an if and only if their languages, so the regular languages they denote, are equivalent. And this is um, kind of this is quite powerful because it's a finite axiomatization and you can really use it to do program transformations. If I give you a program and I give you its abstraction, you can, you can use these equations to reason about it. Or you can do the translation to automata and do the reasoning there. But in any case, this um, correspondence um, between automata on the one hand languages and then regular expressions has a very tight um, connection. And you have both the uh, soundness and completeness theorem uh, from Cosen in the 90s and Kleene's theorem from the 50s kind of gives you this loop. And you can basically reason about traces in any of these um, formalisms and get something about equivalence. That's kind of neat. The, um, Attention on, on equivalence algorithms uh, came back a few years ago, and, and there was so there's a famous algorithm from the 70s, Hopcroft and Karp, which is nearly linear to check equivalence. And then uh, back in, in 2012, I think, uh, Damia Pus and, and Filippo Bonchi did an improvement on that algorithm and um, have a new sort of technique uh, to check for equivalence. So actually, this problem of equivalence of regular languages is still quite active. There's still quite some active research on it. So um, if we want to now add some control flow, meaning we want to encode um, basic imperative programs like if then else or, or while, um, while loops, then what Cosen uh, came up with in the 90s is the following. Well, take your regular expressions. So take your regular uh, algebra. And look at your alphabet and split the alphabet in two parts. One part you used to, to talk about program actions as before. And the other part you 
call it tests, and you generate a Boolean algebra from those tests. And you use that Boolean algebra to basically uh, encode the tests that you have in these control structures. So if I have an if, uh, an if then else, so if I have an if p then p else q, then basically I can think of it as a regular expression in this new language that looks like this. So b after p, non-deterministic choice, not b after q. For the while loop, I do bp, I iterate on bp, and at some point when I exit this iteration, then not b should be true. So if one does this encoding, uh, then the traces of these regular expressions will give you exactly the traces you would expect in the control flow graph of this program. So let me make this a bit more uh, precise. So every program of this sort, or every expression, say, will now be assigned not just a regular language over sigma, like before, but a regular language over an extended alphabet in which the traces look as follows. It's an element of at, which are the atoms of the Boolean algebra that I generated from the tests, followed by a program action, followed by an atom, and so on. So the way to think about it is as follows. I have a program, and I have a bunch of variables, Boolean variables, and every program action can change the value of my Boolean variables. So the behavior of my program is always sequences of state, which is an atom, then a program action, and that program action might change the state, so I need the next atom, and so on. So for every action, I have an initial atom and an atom after I execute my action. And uh, so this is what, what it will look like. So for instance, for the if then else, this would be the semantics. So I have an, an atom that captures the fact that B is true, followed by P, and then because I know nothing about P in this case, I can have an arbitrary atom beta. And on the other branch, I have an atom that's, that knows that not P is true, and then I execute Q, that's a typo, that should be Q, and then a beta. For the while loop, I have traces of increasing length, so the number of P's is increasing, and either I exit my loop immediately, because B was not true, and so I never see P, or the B was true, and I saw P once, but then not P was true, so I exited the loop, or I executed P twice, and so on. Okay, so you have this new type of languages, but in essence, if you now kind of ignore the fact that I have these new symbols, these new atoms, these are still regular languages. And I still can reason about them as before um, using automata. So <clears throat> CAT was uh, object of, of study in the 90s and indeed in the similar vein to Clinical Algebra. Uh, there was an axiomatization of equivalence proposed, there's been a Kline theorem proposed and um, algorithms for automata equivalence. And there are some, in, some nice applications on, on verification of compiler optimization, for instance, okay? And so this, this sort of strategy, so you start with an abstraction in the first instance Kline algebra, and then you extend it with tests, and now suddenly you can um, talk a little bit more about other properties of the program, not so much just what the actions are, but also what the control variables might do to change, um, so this sort of program has been applied to, to other languages, and I just briefly um, show you that. So um, this is what we call the CAT tower principle. Uh, so starting from Pliny algebra, CAT was introduced by, by Cozen in the 90s to reason about simple imperative programs. And then um, about six years ago, uh, we extended it with some networking con constructs to talk about reachability in networks, and later with um, a probabil probabilistic choice that allowed us to talk about congestion. And um, currently, we're looking at extending it also with concurrency. So this is kind of the, uh, where, 
sort of the two lines of work I'm doing um, join. Uh, and the idea of these extensions is that for, for every extension, we want to have the semantics and the algorithms of the languages to be preserved, to be there. So in the case of CAT, as I said, in the 90s, they did the exercise again. So they did, they did an axiomatization, and they did a clean alike theorem, and they did algorithms for equivalence. And all, all these extensions that we've been developing in the last few years uh, have this property, that we want to kind of hold on to the nice decidability properties of regular languages. And that restricts a little bit the properties we can verify, but gives us a hold on um, how fast and, and how well we can verify certain properties. Um, and we, the reason why Clini algebra is a good basis for a lot of these languages is that it has a compositional semantics, meaning that you can verify larger and larger programs by looking at the smaller components. Um, so this enables sort of scalable um, verification. OK, so back to, uh, this was just a, a little parenthesis, but now back to the main um, topic of, of the talk. So we looked at Clini algebra, and we looked at Clini algebra with tests. So now if you remember in that square, um, going down, there was concurrent Clini algebra. So concurrent Clini algebra was introduced in 2009 as an extension to Clini algebra with a parallel operator that basically says, as you'd expect, if I have a program P and a program Q, I put them in parallel, and they should execute concurrently. The semantics was, was proposed in this original paper as languages of POM sets or partially ordered multisets. And basically, the idea behind the semantics is, instead of having uh, regular languages of traces, now we need to capture the fact that certain actions are going to happen really in parallel. So we know that certain actions might happen sequentially, but there will be actions of which we don't know. So for instance, the following program, A followed by B parallel C followed by D, would be assigned um, a semantics, a POM set that looks as follows. So I know that A is before B and C, but I know nothing about the order of execution of B and C. I do know, though, that B and C are before D. But basically, this is the, the only thing I know about the traces of, of this program. Okay? And so in 2009, um, this was kind of the, um, the state of the art on, on CKA. Uh, unfortunately, the sort of tick box that we had for this extension um, was not there. So in the original paper, they didn't really look at um, providing a sound and complete axiomatization or at the decision procedure or at the Clini theorem. They did propose, however, some axioms that they uh, deemed were reasonable. For instance, you know, that the parallel is commutative and associative that interacts with the non-deterministic choice so distributes over non-deterministic choice. Um, that if I put a program in parallel with a program that aborts, then that should be abort. Um, this axiom is slightly controversial, but let's, let's take it at face value that it makes sense. Um, if I put a program in parallel with skip, then that should be the same program. Then the other thing they also uh, proposed was how to reason about the interaction between sequential composition and parallel. So if I have in parallel two threads that have themselves um, a sequential execution, what can I say about the interaction of E and H and G and F? So what they proposed in this 2009 paper is that the following should hold. If I have E in parallel with G, followed by F in parallel with H, this is what I'm describing here, then that should not give me more behavior than if I first sequentially compose E and F, and then I put that in parallel with G and H. And this was an axiom um, that was referred to as the exchange law. 
because you kind of exchange the um, sequential composition and the parallel, and was what um, Tony Hoare and, and collaborators said captures true concurrency. And it captures more than, uh, it has, sorry, it has interleaving as a special case. So in, in many algebraic frameworks to reason about concurrency, the parallel is equated with interleaving. So you say E parallel in, with F should give me the same thing as first doing E and then F, or first doing F and then E. And what, um, what these authors argued is that you want more than that. You don't want to equate things with interleaving. You want to really capture traces in which you can have um, true concurrency. So you can have actions truly in parallel. And this was the equation they proposed as, as capturing that. And um, so when we started looking at, um, at the axiomatization they had proposed, we decided we were going to try to prove that this is axiomatization was actually um, sound and complete. And so we, um, we started this, this project with a student um, with the goal of ticking all the boxes. And so in 2017, we actually showed that um, you, can, you can give a clean theorem to, to POM set languages. So if you take the semantics that um, if you take the semantics that these authors proposed using POM set languages, you can actually show that there is a class of automata, a well class, a well-defined class of automata that accepts exactly the languages denoted by CKA expressions. Um, we then later went on to show that the axioms that they proposed were indeed um, sound and complete, and we characterized the free model um, of this algebra. This was in, in 2018. And so, in some sense, we ticked the box for CKA. So that made us, made us happy. Uh, and we thought, OK, so next we do CCAT, and this should be easy as well. Uh, and then hopefully soon we would have CNETCAT, which is this concurrent language to reason about networks, which was our ultimate goal back in 2016. So the starting point for, for CCAT was this paper by Peter Gibson from 14, in which um, Peter said, well, you start with CKA. Uh, so you start with, with CAT. You add the CKA parallel. Um, and so CAT is basically regular expressions, as I said before. But then you have these tests, which are uh, Boolean algebra terms. And um, you look at this, so you look basically at bringing CKA and CAT together. And you give semantics in the usual way, meaning you take POM set languages, like the authors of CKA proposed, but now not over actions as before with clean algebra, but over those traces that have atoms, actions, atoms, actions. So Peter proposed a, a semantics in which these terms would be assigned to POM sets that have both atoms and program actions and, um, and show that you could, you know, you could do the usual algebraic, um, algebraic results on this language. And he was very happy about it and published the paper. And we were very happy to find this paper and thought we can take it and use it. And then we started playing with the system a little bit. And we discovered that there was a slight problem. Namely, if you take the system that um, Peter proposed, namely taking, you take CKA, you take CAT, all the axioms, and you put them together, you could prove the following. So you start with a program that has a test P, and then an execution E, and then a negation of P. And you can do a, a few applications of the rules of, um, of CKA. And so for instance, here, the first one, I'm using the fact that sequential composition is always below parallel. Um, so this, this has to do with the interleaving axiom that I showed. Here, I'm using the axiom from CKA that says anything in parallel with 1 is equal to itself. Then here, I'm using the exchange law, so the CKA law. Then here, I'm using the fact that E after 1 should be E. So I'm down to this expression. Now, P and P bar 
sequentially composed, because these are tests, is the same thing as the n from the Boolean algebra. But p and not p is just bottom. Bottom is 0. And 0 in parallel with e is 0. Okay. So what have I just proved? Well, I've just proved that p, e, not p is the same thing as 0, which in fact says that every test is an invariant of every program. So what this is saying is that if I have a test p and I execute any program e, at the end not p is true. So this being equivalent to 0 is actually equivalent to a whole triple of p, e, not p, which basically tells me that every test is an invariant of every program. So this is an example of something that, so when Peter did it, algebraically it made sense. His paper has no mistake. I mean, the paper is completely sound. The problem is, for the domain specific you want to use it in, so for the verification task at hand, if you look at the expressions as programs, this makes no sense. I mean, if I, I suddenly have an algebraic framework that tells me that every test is an invariant of every program, then I won't be able to verify anything very interesting about it. So there must be something that in Peter's framework that went wrong. So there was something in this combination of CKA and CAT that didn't go very well for, for the task at hand. So I said before that one of the axioms was slightly controversial, and it's one of the axioms I used in that derivation. So maybe we should drop that axiom, that E parallel with a board is a board. Or maybe it's the case that you know, the exchange law that was proposed as the axiom of true concurrency is not quite, quite there. Or, or maybe it's the fact that you know, I shouldn't be replacing things under parallel so freely. So there, you know, there, there seems to be ways um, in which we could look at solutions for this. Um, however, if we take a step back again and you think about the type of programs you're looking at, you will realize that maybe the problem is elsewhere. Um, so this is a this goes back to to Bergstra and Ponce in 2011. But let's say you have a chicken crossing a road, and it's a very smart chicken. So it looks to the left and it looks to the right, and you know. While it's looking to the right, from the left there's a bike. And so when the chicken crosses the road, it gets hit by the bike. The chicken did look left and did look right. And there was nothing. The problem was, while the chicken was looking right, some, something happened on the left that changed the state of the road. So the road suddenly had a bike. And that's exactly the insight that we took um, in order to try to fix the problem with, um, with CCAT. All along in CAT for sequential programs, we identified the conjunction from Boolean algebra with sequential composition. And that was really neat for CAT because it meant that the Boolean algebra of tests was actually a subalgebra of the, the Kleene algebra that we were looking at. However, once you have concurrency, you have interference. So the, the state of your variables, so between the, the sequential composition of P and Q, there could be something, if this is executed in context, in parallel with another program, there could be something in between that actually changes the value of these variables. So you cannot identify anymore the end and the sequential composition. I mean, you can say something about it. You can say that the end will be below that, but you cannot have an equivalence. And you also cannot identify the program skip with the top of the Boolean algebra. So that's not valid anymore. Because when you put this one in, in parallel and the top, this will give you different semantics. And so this brought us to changing a little bit the diagram we had before, and instead of having moving from Kleene algebra to Kleene algebra with tests as before, 
Uh, we now have a new system, which we call clinical algebraic observations, which distinguishes the Boolean algebra structure, namely the conjunction, from the sequential composition. And with that distinction, you can actually develop a new algebra, clinical algebra with observations, that behaves exactly like linear algebra with tests when you're looking at sequential programs, but will give you the, the power to combine it with a concurrent operator without generating the interference that um, gave the problem Peter had in, in his system. So this is um, work that um, appears in um, Concur this year, early September, and there's an upcoming um, paper that's under submission in which we, um, we actually merge the two systems. And we show that at this stage, indeed, you can repeat what Peter did and show uh, completeness and soundness and decidability. And so going back to the concurrent program, we started with some slides ago. What we did was basically taking the axioms of cleaning algebra and Boolean algebra. We keep conjunction and sequential composition distinct. We then add concurrent linear algebra axioms. And based on that, you can then prove a soundness and completeness theorem that says if two expressions are the same, their death semantics in terms of POM sets are also the same. And uh, you can also give a decidability procedure. And this brings me uh, pretty much uh, to the end of, of my talk. I hope I gave you um, a flavor of this program of using regular expressions and clean algebra as a basis of verification frameworks. This was the square we started with in 2015-16 and hoped we would be able to fill the, the dotted bits um, very easily. Unfortunately, um, this required a bit more work and, and some changes on the way uh, to develop a uh, framework, an algebraic framework, to look at both control flow and concurrency and to, to give a sound and complete axiomatization and decidability. We are currently instantiating this uh, CCAL framework um, to actually do verification of these um, little uh, litmus tests that come from weak memory models. Um, and we're looking at the sort of partial function memory model um, to do the verification task. And soon, hopefully, we'll go back to our original motivation, which was um, an application in network verification and to look at things like stateful firewalls uh, and, and other um, network tasks and, and to verify that they indeed do what um, they are supposed to be doing. And this brings me to the end, and I'm happy to take some questions. For cleaning algebra with tests, there is a propositional dynamic logic, right? That works well with it. Is there any logic for your uh, algebra CKO? Um, that's a good question. Uh, let me think for a second. Um, there has been work on, on sort of concurrent PDL, which I would hope will have a connection with this, but I, I haven't looked at it. And I, I mean, this. This work is like just fresh, so I, I don't think anyone has looked at the connection. Okay. Maybe I missed something, but you sort of go away from Boolean algebra of tests to these observations. You uh, didn't really expand on the POM set model with observations. Can you right. say something? So um, I, I should have been a bit more careful. So the observations themselves still have a Boolean algebra structure. The only thing we do is distinguish between the sequential composition and, and the conjunction. So we're st we still have the Boolean algebra structure there. So you had on your slide uh, one not equivalent to top. Um, yep. Is that something that you can derive from uh, P E P bar equals zero? I mean, how do we, uh, uh, how do we understand this thing, do we understand this as an inconsistency which gives you all kinds of things? No, so, so the only thing I meant by that is that we removed, we removed this axiom from the system because we won't, so you see when you have, um, so when you have P and Q smaller or equal than P followed by Q, so that still holds, if you would have 
1 equals to top, then you could derive back that conjunction and sequential composition are the same. So if you have 1 equals top, you basically do the identification axiomatically. You see what I mean? So if I, if I don't remove 1 equals top, which, which was there before, so before, conjunction was sequential composition and 1 was equal to top. Those are axioms of uh, Kleene algebraic tests. Because they basically say that the Boolean algebra is a sub-algebra of the Kleene algebra. So you identify the top with the 1 and the bottom with the 0, the disjunction with the plus and the conjunction with the sequential composition. Now, if I, if I want to remove the identification of, of conjunction and sequential composition, I have to remove also one equal stop. Because if I leave it, I actually can derive that sequential composition and and are still the same. So this is, um, I, can show, I can show you um, the derivation of one. Okay, in the, in the new system, then what changes? I mean, now... So is... in the new system, whenever you have an expression P and Q, if you have top and Q, you can derive that top and Q is Q. But if you have top followed by P, you cannot derive that that's P. So top is now, is now a Boolean value that between being asserted that top is true, so that all variables are true, and the execution of P, some interference could have happened in the meantime. That's, that's the point. But I, I, can, I can show you this offline. It might be easier. Okay. Yeah, th thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, so I was just wondering about the original problem that you started out with. Uh, it, how do you solve that the, uh, about the, you know, the, the uh, assertion at the end of the concurrent program? Oh, right. Uh, um, do you need a whole logic or do you... Do no, so I... Um, you see that expression written there, x equals zero, that expression that is written there below the blue box, um, this expression. This is now uh, an inequality that I can verify in the new system. So it basically tells me that if I start with x equals zero and y equals zero, and then I execute t zero in parallel with t one, where T0 and T1 are expressions just denoting these assignments, then this must imply that R1 equals 0 and R2 equals 0 cannot happen. So the not of it is true. So this is the encoding of Hort triples, propositional Hort triples, into Kleene algebra with tests. So we use the same encoding. Yeah, yeah. So we give this ability so we can check this now. And uh, now we are, in order to, to look at the data values that are inside T1 and T0, we are looking at this partial function model that will make it even, um, will make the decision procedure um, more efficient. Yeah, once again, thanks for the very nice talk. So my question is related to what uh, Deepak asked. So how do these procedures compare with uh, automata theoretic uh, methods? In, in a sense, in they, they are, so the, the underlying procedure for decidability is automata based. So I didn't show the details, but there is an, uh, there is an underlying procedure that is automata based. I mean, something has to give in, right? I mean, this is an undecidable problem. So the programs we can look at and the properties we can look at are very restrictive, right? Because I'm restricting the, so the number of tests and the number of variables and the number of values that you can put in these variables is all finite. So I restrict everything oh, to finite. finite. Yeah. So it's, it's part of my abstraction. So part of my abstraction is to say I have a finite domain. But I guess there are some recent results which show that uh, with some, I think, release acquire memory models, even with finite domain. So with release, with release of, well, yeah, but so again, I mean, there is undecidability even with finite domains. Yeah, you're, you're right. But again, the, the type of things you can write with these expressions, the, like also the branching here, will always be finite. So I don't have a parallel star. I cannot nest the parallel under a star. So I guarantee that I remain in this decidable fragment. So, But I agree that is restrictive. Um, but as I said at some point in my talk, it was also part of the goal to remain in that decidable fragment, even though we might be restricting ourselves in terms of the properties. Um, it's still enough to look at some of these small programs. 
And for the networking application, we believe it's still enough to look at some interesting reachability properties. So, uh, so for that, we're happy. So we, we kind of compromise on the class of automaton properties. My question is actually uh, similar to what he asked, uh, in the sense that, for example, if I have a program where uh, each, so you're taking each uh, control flow statement to be a Boolean, uh, like a state variable, right? So if I have, say, a comparison, like x is less than one or something, you treat that the entire expression as one state variable, and then whether it's true or false. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, but if you want to say include, say, all of natural numbers into it. No. So, so you can do this in this system. So the also the the test of course you cannot do things like you know x is smaller than y plus one that's not possible so it's always x compared to a constant so you have you have a finite number of constants you have a finite number of variables and you're comparing those variables with constants um, and then of course you can encode a limited form of copying and so on but but, but is there known impossibility results. That like you cannot do that, or like maybe you can get a system which is like you don't get completeness, you get. Um, I would say it should be possible by other results I know from verification. But we never we never looked at it, but it should be possible to look to get a sound framework in which you can do um, some form of of copying and comparison and um, and infinite data values. When you said that you use automata theoretic things, is this, what happens to the Brzezowski derivatives in both the syntax and the semantics yeah. of PKA? So we have a construction that uses um, derivatives very similar to, to Brzezowski's uh, in order to obtain something that we call Pomset automata, that is an automaton model that goes back to Gischer in, I believe, in the 80s. Um, so, so yeah. So there's a there's a construction similar to Brzozowski derivatives that you can that you can use there. Thanks very much. Thank you.